So welcome to the first webinar of this university innovation funded OPA Net Scotland project. This project aims to optimise industry awareness and build networks to improve the uptake of disease control strategies for ovine pulmonary carcinoma, adenocarcinoma. It follows on from the findings of the Rural Innovation Support Service RIDS group I facilitated with a group of Glenlivet sheep farmers who identified awareness of OPA and barriers to uptake of transthoracic ultrasound as the limitations for progress in disease control. So I'm Laura Henderson, an agricultural consultant with SEC Consulting based in Elgin. And I'm joined tonight by our two speakers, Dr. Sue Tung, um, a senior veterinary epidemiologist working in the SRUC Epidemiology Research Unit up in Inverness, and Heather Stevenson, the um, SRUC Veterinary Investigation Officer based in Dumfries. So Sue and Heather are going to be doing a bit of a double act tonight. And they will give us some background to OPA, including what it looks like in an infected sheep, how it is spread and a brief overview of how it is diagnosed and controlled, although this will be covered in more depth in next week's webinar on novel diagnostic techniques. Sue will also highlight the results of a survey on Scottish farmers' awareness of OP that she was part of. So we'd like to know if you have or keep sheep. Um, so it's a yes or no. And then the second part is, do you have questions, clients who have or keep sheep. Now, that's mainly because we know there are quite a number of vets and consultants and various other industry representatives in the audience tonight. So tonight we have 65% of our audience are sheep keepers and then we have 63% um, have clients who are sheep keepers and the remaining don't have sheep or no clients. So over to you, Heather. Thank you, Laura. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining the meeting tonight. So what, what do we know about ovine pulmonary adenocarcinoma? Well, I think the first thing to think about is what actually is ovine pulmonary adenocarcinoma? Ovine tells us that it's a disease of sheep. Pulmonary lets us know that it's affecting their lungs and adenocarcinoma is a type of tumour. So basically what it is, is a lung cancer of sheep. Now, as we go along tonight, I'll refer to it as OPA because it's just much easier to get your tongue round. But you might also have heard of it being referred to ag as yagzikte. Now, yagzikte is an Afrikaans word, and that's because that's where the condition was recognised, and that was well over 100 years ago, so it's not a new disease. It, it is, however, a very interesting disease, um, and it throws up some quite big challenges for the sheep industry. And it's spread by a virus. So that's the first challenge. Because it's spread by a virus, it means it's infectious. So it's an infectious cancer of sheep. So it can spread from sheep to sheep, but also from flock to flock through the movement of animals. And the second big challenge we have is we can't take a blood sample and tell you whether your sheep is infected with this virus or not, which means it comes with a challenge of how do we know it's there and how do we control it if we do find it in a flock. So when they get infected with the virus, the virus infects cells within the lungs. You get the formation of tumours, and these tumours replace the normal lung tissue. And if these are just small tumours, you will not notice that anything is wrong with that sheep. But if they get to a certain size, then it can affect the sheep's breathing. They can lose weight. And in many cases, they will also produce excess fluid, which builds up in the airways, making it hard for them to breathe. And any lung damage caused by those tumours can make the affected sheep prone to other infections, such as pastoral and pneumonia. So although the tumour itself might not kill them directly, if they get a secondary infection, 
that can finish them off. So the next slide shows pictures of lungs with OPA. So if we look at the picture on the left hand side, first of all, so that's a set of lungs from a sheep. And if you can imagine that sheep standing up with the lungs still in place, then the sheep's head will be towards the right. Now, the normal bits of lung in that picture are the light pink areas towards the back of the lungs. And if you were to feel them with your hands, they would feel soft and spongy. The sort of darker coloured sections of lung, which in this animal are making up an awful lot of both lungs, those are the sections of lung that are affected with OPA. That is tumour that we're looking at there. And if you were to feel those sections of lung with your hand, they would be very, very firm. The picture on the right shows a section through a piece of the lung tissue. And again, the lung tissue at the bottom is the grey coloured tumour. And you can see why a sheep with a piece of lung like that could find it difficult to breathe because there's not going to be much air passing through that lung. And the pink bits at the top, again, that's your normal lung tissue. When you do talks, you always use good pictures. But in real life, cases of OPA don't always look as obvious as that. Now, I've seen quite a lot of sheep lungs at post-mortem, and sometimes I can't tell whether it's OPA or not. The tumours might be very, very small. And if it's died of pastoral pneumonia, then the changes in the lungs caused by that can hide and disguise the tumour. So it's difficult to see or decide whether there's a tumour there or not, just looking at it by eye. And also when you get an animal that's had pneumonia for a long, long time, you get chronic pneumonia changes in the lungs and they can look very, very similar. Um, so it's important then to do further testing and to absolutely be certain whether or not the, there is tumour there or not. So if we can go on to the next slide, please, Laura. So I mentioned before that in a lot of cases of OPA, you get excess fluid being produced in the lungs and in the airways. So we have pictures of two sheep here. Both these sheep are dead. Um, and they've just been hung up by a back leg. And you can see all this fluid draining out from their nostrils. And that's the typical type of fluid that is produced in a lung with OPA. But just to be aware, not all sheep with OPA tumours in their lungs produce fluid. Some may just produce a small amount. At the other end of the scale, you can get some that will produce up to half a litre in a day. Other conditions, when you look at lungs at post-mortem, you can also see fluid in airways. So again, it's a, it's a sign that it might be OPA that you're dealing with, um, but you need to be absolutely sure. One other point I would make, many of you might have heard of the wheelbarrow test, which is when you have a live you and you think it might have OPA and you lift up her back legs like you would do when the kids are having a wheelbarrow race just to find out if the fluid drains out their nose. That That is very unpleasant and stressful for that animal um, and if you're going to do that then for welfare reasons and just to be kind to the animal you should ideally have a way of humanely uh, euthanizing them after you've done it if you're getting a lot of fluid coming out like that. So what's important about that fluid is that it contains the virus. The virus is called the Yaxicti sheep retrovirus. So if we go on to the next slide, we'll think a bit more about how OPA passes from sheep to sheep. So the sort of fancy term for it is it's via the aerosol route. Now, all that means is that you've got tiny droplets containing the virus are spread from the respiratory tract. Now, you're not going to be aware of these droplets. Um, if you think about when you sneeze, the droplets when you sneeze can be propelled 
for quite a long distance. Um, but these sheep are probably exhaling tiny, tiny droplets containing virus just when they're breathing normally throughout the course of the day. It can also be transmitted in colostrum and in milk. And that's because some of the virus will be in blood cells and white blood cells in the bloodstream. And some of those cells will cross into the colostrum and the milk. Once it's in the environment, it is able to survive for a few weeks. It's a bit dependent on temperature, but you could be looking at up to six to eight weeks. And the other thing to bear in mind that we'll come back to later is younger animals are the most susceptible to infection, as is the case with so many other diseases. But knowing a bit about how it's transmitted, then we can think about how then can we go about controlling it? And in particular, how do we protect young lambs from getting infected in the first place? How do we reduce the spread? So your infected sheep can appear healthy for a long, long period. Um, the incubation of this disease can be months to years. And most sheep, most sheep don't have a particularly long productive lifespan. So many infected sheep will appear entirely normal for the whole time that they're in a, a flock and then they'll be culled for age or for whatever other reasons and you will never know that they've been infected with OPA virus. Next slide please, Laura. So following on, we know if we know a bit about transmission, we can think about what practices might increase the risks of, of spread. And really it's anything that puts a large number of sheep in a small space. So prolonged housing periods, trough feeding, high stocking densities, which could be inside or outside. And moving things like moving thin ewes in with younger animals, you're thinking, oh, be good to these thin ewes, we'll give them a bit of extra feeding. Um, but what you might be doing is if they are infected and they're producing droplets with virus in them, you might be spreading it to the, the younger sheep in the flock, uh, which are, are more at risk. So what we're looking at is, is anything really that you've got lots of sheep in together, trough feeding, perhaps even um, feed blocks. If you think about sheep behaviour, and if we think about you behavior behavior after lambing, what's the first thing that you does? The first thing that you does is she turns round and she's nuzzling that lamb, she's licking that lamb to clean it up, she's encouraging it to stand up. Now, if she has OPA and she is passing virus droplets out from her nose, then that lamb then is at risk. So if we think a bit more about age and, and how that increases the susceptibility to OPA. The virus targets some very specific cell types within the lung, particularly ones called type 2 pneumocytes, but also ones called Clara cells. It's not really important to remember these names in any way. The important thing is that in newborn lambs, there are lots more of these cells present in the lungs than there are in mature ewes. And the other thing about these cells in newborn lambs is lots of them are proliferating and dividing. And the Yxipti sheep retrovirus likes to infect cells that are dividing. So it's kind of like a double whammy for newborn lambs. They've got lots of the target cells and they've got lots of the target cells that are actively dividing um, soon after birth. So that makes it much easier for the virus to infect these animals. When it comes to adult ewes, or even slightly older lambs, there'll be less of these target cells and they're not necessarily dividing, which makes it much harder or even perhaps impossible for the virus to infect them. But 
if that sheep has another lung disease or an infection or anything that causes a little bit of lung damage, then when you get any damage in the body, cells often have to divide to repair it. And that then could give the OPA virus the opportunity to infect these animals. So in, in summary, sort of any age of sheep could pick up infection with OPA virus. Um, but the newborn lambs, it's much more likely to happen. So what happens after they get infected? The incubation period is really, really variable. So it might depend on the age of infection and also depend on the number of virus particles that infect the animal. And it could be from months to years under natural conditions. Experimentally, it can be much shorter than that. But if we go on to the next slide. Good evening. So with such long natural incubation periods uh, and with the diagnostic challenges that Heather's alluded to and we'll come back to, OPA is one of the five chronic sheep diseases known as iceberg diseases. And they're so called because just like icebergs, uh, there's a lot more going on than what you see. They're insidious. Infection can enter and be present in a flock. And as you've heard from Heather, um, but it can spread within a flock without you really knowing about it. So it may have spread very widely before causing an observable problem. And when you do notice that problem, it then turns out to be a much, much bigger problem than what you can initially see, which makes it hard to control. And it means that early detection is really important. And early detection is um, very much dependent on awareness, both at a flock and farmer level and at a veterinary level. But awareness is difficult to quantify. So we had the opportunity uh, with some funding from the Scottish Government in the Strategic Research Pro Programme to have a look at could we get a handle on what the awareness was in Scottish sheep farmers? In 2006, 2008, colleagues from Morden and from SRUC Veterinary Services uh, had done a survey, representative survey of Scottish sheep farmers, where they'd looked at 125 flocks for a number of different diseases. And within that survey, there had been a questionnaire on um, whether far those farmers were aware of clinical signs, of control measures, et cetera. And a lot of those farmers, in fact, all of them, had said that they were willing for us to contact them in the future if we needed to. So we thought, why don't we find out if what their awareness is now by utilizing the same questions. If we go back to them in 2020, um, could we see if that awareness and, and knowledge of OPA had changed? Unfortunately, with the COVID restrictions, we couldn't go back and do it in person as we had done originally. In that very original survey, um, there had been very low levels of awareness about aspects of OPA diagnosis and control. We couldn't go back and do it in person, so we contacted uh, the farmers, offered them the opportunity to opt out, and then if they didn't opt out, we phoned them and had some discussions, went through the original questionnaire with them again. And it speaks very well of the Scottish sheep industry that just over a third, 10 years later, were prepared to engage with us on this. And the good news was that four out of five of those sheep farmers had not had any new or suspect cases in that 12 year interval. Three out of four of them had made major biosecurity changes but on 
the actual OPA itself, the identification of correct clinical signs had improved. There was increased awareness of both cl correct clinical signs and of prevention and control strategies. But there were still some misconceptions. And throughout this webinar, we're going to bring you more details of the results as we come across the different subjects and see with your participation, please, in the polls, how your knowledge compares uh, to these farmers. Which of the following clinical signs you would associate with an OPA case? So the options are increased respiratory rate, decreased respiratory rate, coughing, difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing, decreased appetite, weight loss, visible external masses or tumours or other. And if you use other, if you could please state that in the chat box so we see what you're thinking. Our attendees tonight, 91% uh, have said difficulty breathing and weight loss as some of the things. And 82% have said increased respiratory rate, 59% say coughing, 42% say decreased appetite, 6% decreased respiratory rate, 5% difficulty swallowing, 10% say other, and in the chat box we've had a range of responses to that, um, including exercise intolerance, struggling to keep up with the rest of the flock, high adult mortality and replacement rate, um, fluids um, at the nares, like Heather showed us earlier, increased risk of mastitis and separation from others. And then the remaining 2% said visible masses or tubers. So that's really interesting. And, uh, and we'll need to process those in, in detail a bit later, and we will feed that back after the webinars. Um, but what the firm respondent said at the time was just over three in four of the farmers correctly identified at least one of the correct clinical signs. Now, you might ask, uh, is that just due to chance? However, compared to in 2006, 2008, um, it was only one in five at that point could correctly identify at least one correct clinical sign. And 23 out of the 24 had improved their knowledge over that period. But there was also the situation where um, only one in four of them only picked correct clinical signs of OPA and about three quarters of them picked at least one of the what we would think of as incorrect clinical signs and the most common clinical sign that was incorrectly associated with OPA for those far farmers was a little bit similar to yourselves um, the decreased appetite, 52% uh, of them picked that. Um, and it's not really recognized as one of the clinical signs, which brings us to the difficulties of um, both surveys and of observing sheep um, when they're ill. So if I just back, hand back to Heather for the next slide where she'll go through the recognized clinical signs. Thank you, Sue. It was it was interesting that quite a number of people mentioned lagging behind and not keeping up with the rest of the flock as one of the, the other possible clinical signs, because the African's name Yagzikte translates as driving sickness or chasing sickness. So that's exactly what they picked up on as well. So some of the problems with the clinical signs is that they're not specific to OPA. They could be caused by a very large range of other problems in sheep. So weight loss, well, there's any number of reasons that a sheep could lose weight. But as Sue says, these sheep are often still eating well. Exercise intolerance. We saw the pictures of the, the lungs with large tumour masses in them. And yes, combination of that and fluid 
it's going to make it harder for these sheep to breathe, harder for them to, to keep up with their flock mates. They might, under certain conditions, if they've been gathered or stressed, be open mouth breathing. They could just look like they have a touch of pneumonia. They might be breathing quicker than you would expect or just breathing more deeply than you would expect. There could be a cough, there could be a nasal discharge. The difficulty with sheep in assessing these type of clinical signs is, as you well know, if you the way the sheep is breathing might depend on the environment it's in. Is it a housed sheep on a warm day? Is it a sheep that's just been gathered up by the dog? Is it a sheep that's stressed? So it might be helpful to compare the sheep that you're concerned about to other flock mates nearby. When you listen to the lungs of sheep with OPA with a stethoscope, then there might be very little to hear in some cases. And what you might get is, is in the areas of tumour where there's little air flow through, that might be a bit quiet. But then in other areas, perhaps just surrounding the tumour areas where there's fluid in the airways, you might get crackles through your stethoscope. So think a bit like Rice Krispies. Um, and that's just to do with the, the air mixing in with the fluid there. But it has been studied um, comparing clinical signs like how fast are they breathing, how deep are they breathing, do they have a temperature, and people have compared these in healthy sheep without OPA and sheep with OPA. And certainly sheep with OPA in the earlier stages, you cannot pick them out based on respiratory rate or how deeply they're breathing compared to a healthy sheep that's that's uninfected. So while they might show clinical signs, by the time they're doing that, they might have quite advanced disease. And the one thing that wasn't on your list of options is sudden death. And that's what, referring back to what I mentioned before. When you have sheep with tumours or fluid in their lungs because of OPA, it can make them more prone to pasteurella pneumonia. So you may just find them dead. And at that point, they can be in good body condition. So OPA might not be anywhere um, on your list of differentials of the diseases you're, or problems that you might be thinking about at that time. No bother. In the last five years, have you seen any cases of OPA that can either be in your own flock or your client's flocks? And if you have seen OPA, um, how was it detected or diagnosed? Was it self-diagnosed by a veterinary surgeon, um, by Heather and any of her colleagues um, in the vet labs, whether that's SRUC here in Scotland or the APHE um, across the country? Um, and if it was otherwise, um, please state in the chat. So 72% of our audience tonight have seen cases of OPA in the last five years. And when we've asked them when it was detected and diagnosed, um, we've got quite a good split here. We've got 37% by a vet, 30% by um, Heather and her colleagues, 22% other, and in the chat we have got lung scans and guess work um, because there were um, several other ones affected and 11% were self-diagnosed. So how can OPA diagnosis be confirmed? Um, we're sort of along the lines of what we've just said, there's multiple choices here. Um, so clinical signs alone, the wheelbarrow test, post-mortem, blood sampling or ultrasound. So 98% of our audience tonight have said post-mortem, 58 ultrasound, 45% wheelbarrows test, 4% clinical signs alone and 5% blood sampling. Thanks, Laura. I think probably in reality, when it comes to getting an absolute diagnosis, 
then often there's been a combination of all those things going on together. Um, but the main difficulties are there is no commercially available laboratory test. One of the reasons for this is a sheep that is infected with OPA doesn't produce an immune response to the virus, which is quite unusual for diseases. Um, there is, a, they don't produce any antibodies. The reason that they don't produce any antibodies is in the sheep's DNA, there are actually parts of the sheep DNA that look very, very similar to the Yxicti sheep retrovirus, which means that when a sheep becomes infected with the virus, its immune system doesn't recognize it as foreign. Um, and antibody tests are often the cheapest. There are um, virus particles in the blood associated with white blood cells, but they tend to be there in very low levels. Because they're there in very low levels, the test might not be sens very sensitive in some cases, so it might miss signs of infection. In theory, you could also detect the virus um, from the fluid, from the, the tumours themselves, from colostrum, and from nasal swabs. And when you're trying to look for virus, then you're usually using what's called a, a PCR test, um, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. And you're actually trying to detect the virus RNA or genetic material. So those tests can be quite expensive. Clinical signs we've discussed, they're helpful. They might not be completely specific for OPA. And then we have post-mortem examination, and often that's followed up by histopathology, which, as I said, sometimes what you see in the lungs is not completely clear as to whether it's OPA or not, in which case you can take sections of lung into formalin and they get sent away and sliced really thinly and looked at under the microscope. Um, and the, the scientists that do that uh, can then say yes or no as to whether the tumour is there or not. And then we've got diagnostic imaging options. So ultrasound scanning being the, the most practical and, and that's what will be covered in the, the second webinar. So when we get sheep in for post-mortem diagnosis, it's interesting to see why they end up with us. Now, you've got to bear in mind that all this data is very skewed because it's skewed to sheep that have come to SRUC for post-mortem. And we do tend to get a split in animals that come for post-mortem. We often get them coming in because they've been found dead or because they're ill-thriven. So you can see from the pie chart, in about half of cases that come for post-mortem, they've been found dead. And people want to know why that is. And these are the ones that are often still in good condition. The red sections are ones that come in purely to investigate ill thrift. The blue section of pie is to do with respiratory disease. And the yellow section is sheep that had respiratory disease and are also losing condition. A really common um, reason for sheep to come in, a really common history, is that they've looked like they've got pneumonia, they've been breathing a bit quickly, they've been injected with some antibiotics, they've maybe improved for a few days, a week, a couple of weeks, and then they look like they've got pneumonia again, so they're treated again, and then either they die or because they're thin as well as showing signs of pneumonia, they come in for euthanasia and, and investigation. So if we go on to the next slide. This gives you the breakdown for use and tops for the age that they've come for post-mortem. So again, remembering this is a skewed population, then 
you can see that in use, the peak age for diagnosis is three to four years of age, which fits in with results from other studies and surveys. But if you look to the left hand side of the graph, you can see that in some cases, animals are being diagnosed at less than a year of age. So you can get OPA being diagnosed in lambs maybe at five, six months of age, but that, that is uncommon. The other thing you might notice is that when we look at the diagnoses in tops, which is the blue areas on the graph, then they seem to get diagnosed perhaps more often at a younger age. But again, I think that may just be a reflection of the fact that these are the animals that are perhaps more likely to get investigated if they've been found dead. So if you've spent money on buying in a top and it dies within six months of arriving on your farm, then you're perhaps more motivated to find out what's gone on with it. Next slide, please, Laura. We will often get batches of sheep in for investigation of ill thrift. And the most common times of year for that would be looking at ewes that have failed to gain weight after weaning or looking at thin ewes that have scanned empty. So thin ewes after weaning, then usually what happens is they're identified as being in poorer condition than the rest of the flock and they're put in a group of animals on good grass or they're supplemented. And most of these ewes will put condition on over the next four to eight weeks. But there might be a few that, despite the fact that they've got access to good grass and they're still eating, they just don't gain condition. And there might be no obvious reason for that. So these aren't animals that are broken mouth. They aren't animals that are chronically lame. They aren't animals that have got uh, chronic mastitis. So these are the ones that you want to target if you're going to go down this route. And if you're in Scotland, then you're able to submit two to four typical cases and have them examined for a cost of just under £100. Now that cost will vary obviously depending where you are in the rest of the UK. But it's not just useful for looking for OPA, it's a good screen for iceberg diseases in general. And it will pick up other issues that are perhaps just one-off problems in individual sheep, like problems with their heart, say endocarditis, or other sporadic causes like um, lung abscesses. So it's something to consider if you've got thin ewes that there's limited market value for them, um, and you're wanting to get to the bottom of, of why they're thin. So I'll hand you back over to Sue now. So I think uh, from the answers to those previous calls, it's very evident that we have a very different population here uh, in the audience than we had um, from our very small farmer survey. Um, only one out of five of those farmers had had a new or suspect case in the last uh, 12 years. And uh, three out of four of those had actually self-diagnosed those cases. Um, uh, only one out of a quarter of them actually getting a veterinary diagnosis there, which I think indicates that there is uh, opportunity improving the farmer veterinary collaborations and, and working together here uh, to try and improve um, diagnosis. And I'm just warning everybody, I've just had a, a sign to tell me that my internet connection is unstable. So if I vanish or crack up, then um, it's the internet, not me. Um, so what it does do is, again, it brings us to the fact that estimating how much is out there. Um, Laura, if we can have the next slide, please, is, is really difficult, really, really difficult. Um, clinical cases submitted for postmortem to SRUC or in um, Scotland over the last five years. 
And as Heather said, they may be post-mortem rather than clinical cases, have led to 30 to 56 um, diagnoses, diagnostic cases of OPA per year. Um, that's just the, that skewed tip of the iceberg. Uh, and there's been a New Zealand, sorry, a Northeast England survey of fallen stock in 2012-2013, which gives us a different bit of the picture. Uh, as Heather mentioned, they might just find that they've suddenly died. And in fallen stock, they found from that area, there was six out of 106 sheep. And it's just very, very difficult to get a handle on prevalence with the data that's available at all. Heather's got a few more figures for you. So I think this slide covers mostly what Sue has just already said, that in the original survey in 2008, 12% of 125 Scottish farmers thought they'd had OP in their flocks. Um, surveys since then have returned lower figures. And the most recent one being in 2014, an avatar survey that found OPA in just under 1% of 3,385 plucks from, from cull ewes over one year of age. So that survey was carried out in Birmingham. So these were healthy animals that were fit to travel. They'd passed pre-mortem inspection. Um, so maybe a little bit of an underestimate of the, the true prevalence. If we can see the next slide, please, Laura. So this slide is showing data from APHA and SRUC. So again, bear in mind, it is skewed data, but it shows you that any region in that map that's colored in green, excluding Northern Ireland and Ireland, then these are regions where OPA has been confirmed in animals that have come for post-mortem examination. This data is available to anyone on the internet. Um, if you do a search for the, the disease surveillance dashboard, then, then you will find this. We can have the next slide, please. And you can target it in to look for information by region. So I've highlighted the, the borders there, and that's giving a, a total number of diagnoses over, I think it's a 10 year time period of 116. But obviously, bear in mind, again, this is skewed data. It might be a region with high numbers of sheep. Um, it might be an area where there is still a local VI centre, so it's more straightforward for people to take animals to get uh, a post-mortem examination carried out. Next slide, please. So Sue talked about before this being an, an iceberg disease. So what you have is that not every animal that gets infected with the Yaxicti sheep retrovirus becomes ill. Not every animal that gets infected even develops tumours. So that even those animals that do develop tumours, there's only again a small number of those that actually develop clinical signs and are picked up as being infected. So this, this is our iceberg. And, and in this study flock here, they had two to three percent annual losses, but they thought that perhaps about 30% of the flock were actually virus positive. Next slide, please. So reducing the risks. I, I always think about these sorts of things as, first of all, is it there in the first place? If it's not there, can you keep it out? And if it is there, what can you do to re reduce the spread or the chances of it spreading further within the flock? And I think don't forget absolute basics like quarantine, cleaning and disinfection. So if you're buying in animals, then think about investigating cases of sudden death. Think about investigating cases of ill thrift 
where there's no obvious cause. We talked before about how the disease is transmitted and how newborn lambs are most susceptible. So if you know that a ewe has been diagnosed with OPA and are able to identify her offspring, then don't retain lambs from those ewes as replacements. That might not be possible, or it might be possible to do that on part of your flock, just through keeping better records and identification. It is an issue in particular for certain breeds that are retaining, or certain flocks that are retaining their own replacements with the possibility that the, the problem is just going to be then perpetuated. It's not been proved that any particular breed or sex of sheep is more susceptible to OPA than any other. So we've diagnosed it in a large number of breeds from hill flocks, upland flocks, lowland flocks, and all these sorts of breeds and their crosses. Coming back to how to limit spread, then try and minimise periods of, if you know you have OPA, try and minimise periods of housing and trough feeding. Keeping younger tops in a separate group has been suggested. And the logic behind that is just that perhaps older tops are more likely to have more established tumours, more likely to be passing virus out into the environment. But of course, if you don't have the disease and you don't have good boundary biosecurity, then how are you going to stop it potentially leaking in um, from the movement of, of sheep cross boundaries? Buy from trusted sources is, is a phrase that comes up quite often, and that is a very valid route to go down. And if you've bought from the same source for a long period of time without any issues, then that is a good, a good sign. But have you actually investigated? If you have had any of any bought in animals die, have you actually investigated what the cause of death has been? And if you find OPA in a bought in animal, would that then put you off sourcing further stock from that place in the future? One thing to other thing to think about would be, well, if a flock knows that they have OPA and are putting steps in place to try and reduce the issues that it's causing and are scanning lungs, for example, then does that then make them a better option than a completely unknown source? who may have disease and, and not be doing anything about it because they're just unaware of it. So back to Sue. So the good news that we had um, from our farmer survey respondents was that three out of four of them over the 12 year period had made major biosecurity changes since that previous survey. And this is good news for a variety of sheep, well, for sheep health in general, rather than just APA. Um, over half of them had mentioned that they had had general improvements to the flock health, their flock health. I'm still on the previous, <laughs> talking around the previous slide, Laura, uh, such as um, general improvements to flock health, such as vaccination, worming, or even health plans with their vets. Um, and about half of them also mentioned that they had made changes to their buying in policy. But all of these things would help to decrease the risk of introduction and or spread within the flock. And about 15% of them mentioned that they had um, attempted to avoid contact with neighbours' livestock. So there are sheep farmers out there trying to do things. And again, uh, this is a, an area that has improved over time. Uh, but it is an area where there is still scope for more improvement and collaborative multidisciplinary working and teamwork to improve the health of our sheep. 
in, in conjunction with decreasing the risk of introduction, um, then the, their awareness of prevention and control strategies had also changed. Um, nine out of 10 of them correctly identified at least one correct prevention and control strategy. But again, there was room for improvement here with half of them identifying something that was either incorrect or not from the list that they were given or was not available for OPA. A greater proportion of those who had seen OPA in their flock correctly identified signs and prevention and control strategies for OPA compared to those who'd not seen OPA in their flock, which um, highlights this, this issue of people become more aware of things when they've actually been affected by them um, rather than tending to work uh, for prevention rather than ending up with something and then having to control it. So we have one more poll, I think it is. Yes, so our last poll of the night is which of the following could be considered as prevention and or control strategies for OPA? And it's a multiple choice, um, so you can pick as many options as you like. So there is vaccination, culling affected animals, culling parents of affected animals, culling offspring of affected animals, culling siblings of affected animals, buying from accredited free flocks, running a closed flock, not sharing transport, avoiding contact with neighbour sheep and other, and you could specify that in the chat. So I think Heather's can already given you some of these answers. So it's again a question of whether you've been paying attention. So 98% of our audience have voted for culling affected animals, 94% running a closed flock, 92% avoiding contact with neighbour sheep, 78% not sharing transport, 50% culling siblings of affected animals, 48% buying from accredited free flocks, 36% culling parents of affected animals, 13% have said other, and we have got a range of answers coming through in the chat, um, including minimising housing time, avoiding mixing of age groups, regular body condition scoring, snatching and hand reading of lambs, annual thin, thin yow screening, um, keeping cattle instead, ultrasound testing, um, bought in stock, moving to outdoor systems, um, especially for lambing. And then the remaining 1% have said vaccination. Eradication options, the three that are listed there have all been shown to be effective, but for most people are not going to be practical. And in the real world, control options are probably where most people will head. So next slide, please. So this is what happened in Iceland in the 1950s, where if OPA was diagnosed in a flock, they slaughtered the flock out and then they rested, the, they cleaned and disinfected and then rested and restocked after a period of time. So we know that the virus lasts for around up to six, eight weeks in the environment. So if you can rest the grounds and sheds for at least a couple of months, then there shouldn't be any risk or absolutely minimal risk of them picking it up from the environment. But then your challenge obviously is how do you identify animals that are known to be clear of OPA? And it was interesting that around half of the people in the last poll were looking at sourcing animals from flocks that have got some sort of screening in place um, so that they're either low risk or known to be free of disease. But obviously that's not somewhere, a place that we're at just at the moment. Maybe in the future we'll get there. So this is going to be expensive. You're going to lose genetics from existing flocks. If you've got a hefted flock, that complicates it again. 
And as I said, where do you source your virus free replacements from? Next slide, please. Embryo transfer has, has also been shown to be an effective way. It allows you to retain genetics, but obviously, again, it's only going to be relevant to rare breeds, highly valuable animals because of the costs involved. There's going to be a welfare consideration again, and can you identify infection-free recipient use? Transfer across the placenta of OPA virus is not thought to be a major way of spread of infection. Some studies have suggested it may occur, perhaps in ewes that are in the advanced stages of, of disease, and other studies have not shown it to, to happen. But the fact that it is possible to use embryo transfer suggests that it's a very minor route if it happens at all. Next slide, please. And in Germany, um, it was been shown that snatching lambs at birth and hand rearing them is also a way to create an OPA free flock. So in this case, the the, the flock they had a flock that they knew had OPA, and they they snatched the lambs. And you have to really be very well monitored because the lambs can't have any contact with the ewe. They can't suck the ewe, which means they then must be fed with powdered or cow colostrum, which brings its own issues and its, its own problems. Next slide, please. So very labor intensive. So for most people, not an option. You've got the risk of disease outbreaks in intensively housed lambs and the need for really, really strict biosecurity between the ewe shed and where the lambs are being reared. Because if you're in and around the ewes and there are droplets from the ewe's respiratory tract, the virus, and they're on your hands or your clothes, then you could potentially transfer them to where the lambs are being reared. Next slide, please. So when it comes to control options, I think a few people mentioned this as, as an other, another means of control in the poll. And what you're really trying to do is reducing the risk of the lambs meeting a lot of virus in the environment. So the, the ewes in the flock that are probably least likely to be producing a lot of virus are the, the younger animals. It doesn't mean to say that some of them aren't producing virus, but it's likely that they are producing the lowest amount of virus. So if you were to lamb these separately and retain replacements from them, then year on year, hopefully, the virus challenge to the lambs would be lower um, and it might help reduce the prevalence of disease in the flock. Next slide, please. And then we're down to the options of can we test and can we cull? And I note from the chat that there is now a PCR test available. Um, but as expected, it is, comes at quite a cost. And the problem often with test and cull in sheep flocks based on blood tests tends to be when you've got hill flocks of several thousand ewes and probably individually low value animals, then any test and cull program that involves laboratory tests usually means testing every six months or annually, such as you would do, say, in the cattle health scheme for Yoni's disease, for example. And add to that the cost of the test, then in most instances, it becomes not a viable option. And this is where ultrasound scanning comes into play in that you don't have the additional cost of a test on top of the cost of handling the animals and, and having the vet out for a visit. But I'm sure we can all empathise with the sheep in the picture there. And I think probably over the last couple of years, we're all too become far too used to knowing what it feels like to have a, a swab stuck up your nose. So thank you very much for listening and I will pass you back 
to Laura to round things off this evening. Yes, thank you very much for that presentation. Sue and Heather have been very interesting. Um, and thank you everyone for listening. So if you've got any questions, do pop them in the question and answer box. Um, and as Heather mentioned in the chat box, there's been quite a bit of um, comments um, from a few of the vets in the audience um, about a PCR test offered by APHE. Um, so that will probably be something that we will cover in a lot more depth next week with um, Chris Cousins and Ed Hill um, when they will have their other webinar. But we'll just start with some of the questions that have been coming in. And so we'll start with you, Heather. So at the beginning, you mentioned um, OPA is sometimes called Yagskiti. Um, so is the name Africans or Dutch origin and did it arrive in the UK from abroad or was it already endemic? I don't know that linguistics is my strong point, but I would imagine that it is potentially Dutch or the of Dutch origin and um, there may be people in the audience that are more qualified to, to answer that uh, than than me. Um, the the first described case of what we now know as OPA in the UK was back in the late 19th century. Uh, so obviously they didn't know at that time what uh, what it actually was and what they were dealing with, but it has been there for a, a very, very long time. I, I see I see. there's just a comment there in the chat explaining the origin origin of the word. Um, I think it, it disappeared too quickly for me to, to read it there. I don't know if you caught it there, Laura. Yes, it's Africans, not Dutch, Africans. as the Dutch yeah. would have different spelling. There we go. Right. Um, and you mentioned um, about the kind of different cell types um, and how they kind of change as the lambs grow older. So if the pneumocytes are rapidly dividing in the neonate, why do the cells decrease so rapidly at birth? That, that work has been, is from looking at uh, the cell types that are there in rats and also in ruminants. And I guess there's quite a number of things happening, isn't there, that these cells are producing the, the pulmonary surfactant that's needed to uh, reduce the surface tension in the lungs, which stops the lungs collapsing um, at the end of expiration. Um, and it also means that they can sort of inflate quite sort of smoothly and, and, and evenly as well. So I guess in neonates, then they probably have a need for a larger number of those cells. And then as the lungs mature, the, the need reduces. I guess it's maybe similar to what happens in the, the intestines where there are cell types present in greater numbers in neonates um, than there are in, in more mature animals, which in the case of the gut means that neonates are a lot more susceptible to infection with Yoni's disease. And I guess you've got proliferation because you've got you've got growth going on as well. Yep. And so then another question is, if there is very low levels of the circulating virus, what is the transmission rate from sheep to sheep? Um, that's excluding your yows to lambs that you mentioned earlier. The transmission rate from sheep to sheep won't really relate to the low level of virus that's in the bloodstream because you're highest concentrations of virus are going to be in the actual tumours in the lungs and also in the fluid in the airways and it's that fluid that's producing the, the droplets as the sheep breathes out or coughs that then cause the transmission from sheep to sheep. So any cases where sheep are in 
close contact or they all have their noses down together in a trough or at a, um, a lick bucket or something like that could make it easier for them to, to pick up that infection. Um, and as I said, when the, the ewe is um, licking her newborn lamb as well, that, that's a, a definite danger point. We just had a comment um, in the chat there, but to link to the previous question I asked you and saying that the commencement of breathing may be a driver for the differentiation between the type 2 to type 1 pneumocytes, um, which allow the gaseous exchange. Certainly another. Thank you. Question there. Um, and you mentioned that certainly one of the control um, methods is cleaning and disinfection of your troughs and equipment. Um, can you suggest a suitable disinfectant? Your, your best place to look for a list of suitable disinfectants is there tends to be a list of uh, DEFRA approved disinfectants that you can find online. Um, so any of those should be should be suitable. Yes, they usually come with the uh, dilution rates as well for general purpose cleaning. And just related to the water troughs, um, what about them kind of dealing with them when you're housing? Because obviously the livestock need water. Um, is there anyone that, anything that can be added to the water to suppress um, the virus and reduce the risk of transmission? I think you've got to be a bit cautious about adding things to water because anything that makes it smell different or taste different could reduce water intakes and um, particularly in animals that are are housed or recently housed um, that can lead to other problems um, and I'm not sure how you would guarantee that the concentration of whatever product you are adding to the water would stay at a level, I guess there will be systems that will that you could put in place to do it. Um, but how can you guarantee when a water trough is being or water bowls are being continually used by sheep and they're continually replenished, how do you know that you're achieving the right concentration, particularly if you're not on mains water um, or don't have a, a tank or something like that? I'm not sure if anyone has looked at that as a means of reducing OPA transmission. But it's certainly something I can take to Chris next week, um, seeing as she's done a lot of research on this. Um, and another question about um, control is um, we want to avoid um, contact with neighbouring sheep. So what distance um, should you maintain um, as a boundary fence between your own flock and a neighbour's flock? I think when you're thinking about biosecurity at boundaries, then you're not only thinking about OPA, you're thinking about other diseases as well. So double fencing is obviously a good thing because then if one fence fails, hopefully you're not going to have to be chasing around stock. But ideally, you want to be preventing nose to nose contact um, as a minimum. So don't forget about things like gateways or if you're moving sheep along a road or something like that, the potential for them to come across other sheep under those circumstances. Um, and I think expanding on biosecurity. I think it was mentioned in one of the polls, somebody said not sharing transport and things like that. So it's these sorts of circumstances that you probably wouldn't think twice about um, that you could be tripped up. Yeah, certainly. And um, we just had another comment coming back to the question about water, saying that there's UV systems in use for calf feeding systems. So I'm not sure how suitable that would be for sheep. So it's certainly something to consider. Mm -hmm. um, 
and investigate. Right, I've got quite a few questions here. Um, so one of the things we've suggested to people attending tonight is to do call you screenings. Um, but certainly with the change in the surveillance system, meaning that um, many of the local um, vet labs have closed. So where can people access um, postmortems for call you screening now if the local one has closed? You should discuss that with your with your vet practice. Um, there has been quite a lot of, of training across the UK in post-mortem techniques um, for vets in practice. So that's something that you should have a chat with them about. And if they are unsure or want to discuss what they might find or what, what samples they might need to collect before they go and do the post-mortem, um, then certainly they could pick up the phone to their nearest VI centre um, or SRUC uh, for advice before they do that. Yeah, there's certainly been a lot of vets turning up tonight, um, so they will have um, as much knowledge about OPA now that they will be able to provide everything that you could possibly ask, we would hope. <laughs> Um, and back to you, Heather. Um, I seem to be asking all you the questions to you tonight. But has there been any link to a genetic weakness identified in certain family lines? For example, um, yows from one top be more susceptible to the virus versus um, yows from another top? Not to my knowledge, but Chris might be a better person to answer that question because she's done longitudinal studies in flocks. So I would imagine they will have looked at that that side of things. Yes, I will certainly take that to Chris next week. Um, and there's a few other questions, um, more specifically about um, using the PCR test and scanning. So I would think I'll save them for next week um, so that we can put them to Chris, who is our expert on OP and all these things. Um, and she'll be able to answer them. There was one uh, question I wanted to pick up on there um, uh, that there were, it was in the chat box rather than the Q&A, um, one which related to perhaps combining um, PCR with uh, blood scanning, uh, with ultrasound scanning, and another one about whether SRUC was um, planning to provide certification for accredited blocks. Um, and the, the two are in some ways linked in that, as Heather said, actually accrediting flocks uh, is, is exceptionally difficult to demonstrate that they're disease free um, with the state of play of testing at the moment and the methodologies and technologies available. However, with increasing um, streams of data the and with work with the ultrasound scanning which Chris will no doubt talk about next week but be it beginning to get better handles on how you will perhaps bring different data streams um, together to give a better indication of the probability of disease freedom from a flock but it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be in the next few years. Um, SRUC I, veterinary services, and I think Heather will um, correct me if I'm wrong here, are working with uh, Livestock Health Scotland and the general industry in Scotland and Scottish government to look at a, a pilot for improving monitoring um, in flocks, but that is monitoring, not accrediting um, free and then seeing if that's possible. That's correct, isn't it, Heather? Yes, the, the plan is to do a pilot project on a small number of flocks to see if it's a realistic option going forward. Yeah, so I hope that answers um, 
those questions, not perhaps with the answer you'd want to hear, but it is being worked on. More work is needed, <laughs> further research yeah. needed. Yes, and just linked to that as well, there's um, a question here. Would it be a similar risk-based system to that that we use for unis and cattle um, under the Czech system? Yeah, I think almost certainly it would have to be. It would have to be something along the lines of this particular flock has been screening um, cull use or thin use for a period of X number of years um, with no evidence of OPA being detected. Um, I'm not sure how many years you would have to do that for before you could be absolutely certain there was no risk. That's what we've got to work on. Yeah. And it won't be absolutely certain when we get there, but we'll get there. There's still plenty to explore um, in the world of OPA. Um, tonight has just been a bit of a, a taster, really, um, for things. Um, so um, if you've got any burning questions, do pop them in. Otherwise, we'll kind of start bringing things to a close. Um, so you will see that as part of this um, project, um, we also have produce it, produced a technical note. Um, and we have recorded three podcasts, which will be released soon on various channels, um, featuring Sue and Heather, um, Chris and Ed. And many of you will be signed up for next week's webinar. Um, but if you haven't, and tonight has piqued your interest, then you can do so um, on the link. I'll just pop into the chat box. And just before you go, we'd really appreciate your feedback on tonight's webinar. Um, we have a survey that will take about five to 10 minutes of your time. Um, that will be live for the next week. Um, and I will follow it up via email tomorrow, but I've just popped it in the chat box for you. But if there is anything else that you would like more information on about this project, do feel free to email me directly. Um, at laura.henderson at sec.co.uk. But if there is no more questions, um, I would like to thank you once again for attending tonight. I hope you find it very interesting and um, have left with a little bit more knowledge on OPA. And we would hope to see you at our webinar next week. So thank you and good night. <laughs>